Frankie Crusoe that his healing would be complete. How's he doing, Sister Lynn? Uh, he's, he's doing better. Uh, he's back to work Let's, let's remember Brother Gene also. Yeah. He's wrapped up pretty good. But, uh, he's doing good. <coughs> uh, let's keep him in prayer. Uh, let's pray that the Lord would have his way in this service tonight, touching our hearts. Yeah. Got a young lady that's going to get baptized after the, after the service. <laughs> Brother David and Cindy have been teaching a home Bible study. That's the results of home Bible studies. That's what, that's what happens when, when people see what the Word of God says. I think it's on. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let's lift our voices together. Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house once again. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the promise that your word will not return void, but will accomplish that for what you sent forth. I pray, Lord, every year in this house will be open to hear your word, that your word fall on good ground, that your name be exalted. <clears throat> Touch Dennis tonight, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And give me virtue flow into his body. Brother Frankie's right now. Lord, touch, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray for Danny right now, Lord. That Danny Gallagher, Lord, that in this loss of his son and the service being today, I pray God you comfort and strengthen him as only you can. In the name of Jesus, touch Marie, Lord. Continue to let healing flow into her body. We love you and thank you for it. Lord, have your way again in this service tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> turn to Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. <clears throat> and I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1. Ezekiel 18 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again saying, What mean ye that ye use this let me do this again. What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God. That means forever. That means this is not going to change. Because as long as God lives, God will always live. So he said, as long as I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Israel loved to make excuses for their idolatry. <laughs> They lived according to their own desires and forgot the God of heaven for days without number. Every time they would fall away, God would have to bring judgment upon them to return them to his laws. Like we of today, the children of Israel looked for someone else to blame for their own sin. Actually, this started in the Garden of Eden. Adam, uh, have, you, have you partaken of the tree that I told you not to partake of? God, that woman, that woman that you gave me. And, and when people blame somebody else for the, who they are and their problems, they're really blaming God. Yeah. Bottom line, and that's where it all goes back to. The buck stops at God, and he's going to be alive forever. So, you know, the woman you gave me, is she's the one that, that caused me this problem. If you had to give me that woman, I'd have been a whole lot better off. Then he goes to uh, Eve, what, what have you done? The devil made me do it. <laughs> if you hadn't made the devil, I would, I'd never done wrong. But the devil made me do it. 
and, and the blame game has gone since the beginning until even today. There are people in this church that blame other people for their problems and or their parents for their problems or their grandparents for their problems or, uh, you know, an uncle and aunt. Well, let me not get ahead of myself. <coughs> So uh, in their search for self-justification, they came up with a really cute and logical proverb that went like this. The fathers may eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth will be set on the edge. This meant that wh whatever the fathers of each successive generation did may not affect them. They may not, may not get by, but it would surely affect their children and grandchildren. This was Israel's way of blaming their forefathers and even God for their sin that they committed and the judgment they had to face. By using this proverb, they have absolved themselves from the penalty of their own sin and placed it upon the head of their ancestors. Listen to any psychologist or psychiatrist today. Listen to any of them. And they will attempt to persuade you and that criminals commit crimes as a result of their past environment or the environment that they live in. They blame sin. The blame for sin is never placed squarely on the shoulders of those who commit acts of violence or other crimes. It's always the fault of somebody else or something else. You know, a policeman would never get shot if they didn't put on a police uniform and do their job. They'd never get shot. Uh, I think it was, I heard on the radio, Fox News, I think there were six police officers shot in the last few days in Georgia alone. You know? But all across the land, people are getting shot because they uh, have a job to do and they're doing their job so they get shot. Maybe it was your father. Maybe it was your mother. Maybe it was your aunt. Maybe it was your uncle. Maybe it was some other adult who wronged you as a child and destroyed your self-esteem. <clears throat> After all, the man who loses his job as a postal worker because he's lazy, has a bad attitude, uh, is somewhat justified in walking in and killing his former co-workers because it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault that he lost his job. It wasn't his fault that he was fired. It's their fault because they're better employees than he is. They shouldn't have been better. <laughs> then he, he wouldn't have got fired. He would have kept his job. Sounds kind of warped, but that's the prevalent thinking of the society that we live in today. The criminal has rights while the victim is looked upon as just a coincidence. We just had a, a situation here where somebody kicked a door in on an apartment building that the church owns kicked the door in, and uh, the guy that we rented to is in jail. He probably will be in jail for a long time because he took a woman to a bank here in Bangor. So we might as well talk about Bangor. Took a woman to a bank in Bangor and threatened her that he's going to kill her cat if she didn't withdraw some money and give it to him. Of course, they caught him and he went to jail. And so... A bunch of move-ins, transit people, moved into the apartment. I mean, a pile of them. And they moved into the apartment. Not holes in the walls, not holes in the hallway walls, the stairway. I mean, just, you know, but how are you going to get them out of there? They have a right to be there because the guy who has, hasn't paid his rent for months gave him the right to stay there. So... You have to go to court, you have to hire a lawyer, you have to go and, and you know, go through the process. And I can't go as a, as a pastor, uh, I can't go because you've got to have a lawyer. You know, because uh, this, is a, this is not just a, a, a private thing, it's a, it's a church, it's a corporation, so you've got to have a lawyer. And, you know. Hello? But it's, it's our fault because we let them in. We should never have let them in. <laughs> but it happens. In 1950, a psychologist and a psychiatrist sharing 
uh, the conventional wisdom that crime is caused by environment set out to prove their point. They began a 17-year study involving thousands of hours of clinical testing of 250 inmates in the District of Columbia. To their astonishment, they discovered that the cause of crime cannot be traced to environment, poverty, or oppression. Instead, crime is a result of individuals making, as they put it, wrong moral choices. In their 1977 work, The Criminal Personality, they concluded that the answer to crime is a conversion of the wrongdoer. Wow. Wow. wonder how long this has been around that tells us how to live morally right. And, you know, but, but you've got to have somebody and pay thousands and thousands, no, millions and billions of dollars to figure out what's going to happen. They said, uh, you have to have a conversion. The wrongdoer has to have a more responsible lifestyle. Duh. In 1987, two Harvard professors came to similar conclusions in their book, Crime and Human Nature. They determined that the cause of crime is a, is a lack of proper moral training among young people during the morally formative years, particularly ages one to six. One to six. That's in Christianity Today, August 16, 1993. Christians, here's where the lesson's going. Christians today don't act much different than those who are worldly when it comes to facing up to their sin. We love to play the blame game. I hear people say things like, my former pastor didn't teach me right. That's why I am living the way I am. The church that I used to attend didn't have a good training program or a Bible study class. I was never taught that doing or saying things like that were wrong. And I've heard other things come from the lips of Christians as well, because we don't want to admit that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is in us. We have no fault. We have no need of repentance. Not my fault the church isn't growing. It's the preacher's fault. Not my fault that the rumor was spread so quickly they shouldn't have assumed that I would keep a secret that important in the first place. Not my fault that we lost a family in the church. If they had been closer to Jesus, they wouldn't have left because I said or did what I did. It isn't my fault that they had so many skeletons in their closet that they were ashamed of. I read an article about the manager of a minor league baseball team who was so disgusted with his center fielder's performance that he ordered him to the dugout and assumed the position himself. First ball came in the center field, took a bad hop, hit the manager right in the mouth. The next one was a high fly ball which was lost in the glare of the sun until it bounced off his forehead. The third was a hard line drive that he charged with outstretched arms. Unfortunately, it blew right between his hands and smacked him in the eye. Furious, he ran back to the dugout, grabbed the center fielder by the uniform and shouted, You idiot! You've got center field so messed up, I can't even do anything. Somebody else's fault. We can lay the blame wherever we want. But God spoke plainly to Ezekiel, Ezekiel that the soul that sins will be the one who dies and not those who lived in the past. You cannot blame another human being if you're not saved. You are saved by your choices that you make. The word of God says, I, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. I don't want you to choose death. I want you to choose life. But you have to make that choice. Nobody can make it for you. 
I can't make it for you. Nobody in the church can make a choice for you. You must choose heaven for yourself. Every human being will answer for their own sin, and so will everyone in this room. In James 1, 14 and 15, the Bible says that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. It isn't the fault of anybody else that you sin, that you do wrong. It's our own fault. Until we realize that fact, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And when we stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment, we will have no excuse. You can't blame the church. You can't blame the pastor. You can't blame the deacons. You can't blame the Sunday school teacher for not being good enough because we are commanded of God to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So I have to, I have to dig out the word of God, his truth, for myself. I've got to see what God says. And God's word doesn't change for one individual, and it's different for another individual, and it's different for somebody else. We're all even at the foot of the cross. We have to come to the word of God and let the word shine the light of his word on our heart. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp into our pathway. It's a light to our pathway. We can't blame Papa, we can't blame Mom and Dad or anybody else for not teaching us right. Well, the Word of God says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Remember that it's our eternal soul's destiny that's hanging in the balance. I taught many home Bible studies and, and do teach home Bible studies, and at the end of the home Bible study, the scripture lets us know that my soul is continually in my hands. Put your hands out in front of you and look at your hands. And listen to that statement from the word of God. My soul is continually in my hands. And I always ask this question to the people that I'm teaching. What will you do with your soul? It's in your hands. What will you do with it? Wherever your soul spend eternity, your soul is the real you. It's who you are with all of your feelings and all of your emotions and all that you are. Where will your soul spend eternity? That choice is yours. God won't make you. He won't drag you into heaven. He won't force you to come to church. He won't force you to hear the word of God. You can, you can put your fingers in your ears and shut it off and, and put the earplugs in your ears and shut the word of God off. But someday you will answer to him for the word of God, for the word that he's given. Especially now in these New Testament times, we have no excuse for sin. And we can't lay the blame for sour grapes on somebody else. We've got the presence of the Holy Ghost. We've got the Word of God. We've got the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed at Calvary to redeem us from our sins and cleanse us. We've got the Word of God to teach us to walk uprightly before God. Listen to the words of God to the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 29, and 34. This is the scriptures that let you know what Ezekiel, what the word that came to Ezekiel and the word that came to Jeremiah, listen to, to why this proverb will not be said anymore. As long as God lives, God will not hear it. He will not accept it. Jeremiah 31, 29. In those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten the sour grape and the children's teeth are set on the edge. <clears throat> but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand. And I see God taking Israel by the hand and leading them as a little child. He led them out of Egypt. He said, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Watch this. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people. God said, I'm going to take away all excuses. I'm going to put my spirit inside of man, in the heart of man, so that man has no excuse not to love their neighbor, not to love their husband, not to love their wife, not to love their children, not to love God's people, not to love God's church. No excuses to not get along with one another. No excuses at all. You, you say, well, they shunned me, or they tripped me, or they did this, or they did that. What does it matter? What does it really matter? What spirit are you of? What spirit did God put in your heart? He put a spirit of love. He gave a new heart, a heart of compassion, a heart of mercy, a heart of forgiveness, a heart that cares about how other people feel. And looks to see how you can help them. And be kind to people. He said, I'll put that in their heart. So they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. Wow. Takes away all of man's excuses. Romans chapter 1 deals with that. You know, where they, when man knew God, they glorified him not as God. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God. And so, you know, they did their own thing and they, they made their own choices in life. Every man shall know the Lord from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. What a promise. I will, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How does the Lord's Prayer go? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as... How's the rest of that go? As we forgive. As we forgive. I control the God who made me. He, he put that in my place that I can determine my destiny. I, and I do. I determine my own destiny. How do you get to heaven from Bangor, Maine? You forgive. You love. You care about other people. And brothers and sisters, and you look out for one another. That's how. But not that little chip off. <laughs> As human beings can be so childish. The Bible says that we should become like a little child, but not childish. You know, not always wanting my way. Not, it, it's an absolute necessity that I get my way. Because it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about what I think and what I feel and how I see things. It doesn't matter about me. I don't care about him. I, I care about what I think and what I see and what's important to me. 
You don't know what they did to me. I don't care what they did. And you don't know what they did to Jesus, if, if that's your thought. Amen. You know, that they were, they were mean to him. They crucified him. <laughs> you know, they spit upon him. They cast lots for his garments. You know, that hasn't happened to me. That hasn't happened to anybody here. So we are to love one another.
You know, and, and that happens. It happens in God's church. And that should not be. You know, and then we're going to come and we're going to partake of communion. And we're going to remember why Jesus died to redeem us from sin. Everybody say, from sin. From sin. Not, not in sin, not me and my favorite sin. He come to redeem me from sin. And so I, I've got to walk in that. I, I, I've got to understand that, that God is for me and he wants me saved. He loves me this much. <coughs> Calvary says how much he loves me. So I can't, I, and, and I've got to become like him. When we were created, we were created in his image. We were made like him. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, the image was marred and, and it failed. And so, so redemption's plan kicked in. And so from the beginning, from Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about him. It's all about his story. It's all about his great love. It's all about his tender mercy. It's all about his goodness to me. Hallelujah. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus, when I think of all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. My soul cries out. Hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Hallelujah. And that's what our thinking ought to be about. We ought to think about, more about, not just here at Christmas time, not just at, you know, at, at, at the time when he was born, but at, at what happened in his whole life. You know, he never was married. He never had a wife. We're, the church is his wife, but he was never humanly married. You know, and, and the love relationship between a husband and wife. Never experienced that, you know, because he set that aside. And, and they, they railed at him as he hung on the cross. He saved others. <laughs> his self he could not save. He could have saved himself. But we wouldn't be here tonight. We would have no hope tonight if he would have saved himself. But he didn't. He laid his life down and he said, I'm going to put a new covenant in their heart. I'm going to put it on the inside of them. I'm taking away all the excuses. No more sorrows. No more sour grapes. Look at your neighbor closest one to you and tell him, no more sour grapes. No more sour grapes. When somebody comes, when somebody comes to you with sour grapes and a pout on their face. <laughs> says my teeth on it. No more. No more sour grapes. Hallelujah. Praise God. God took away our excuses for doing wrong. He's taken away our excuses for not living a holy, separated unto Him life. He's removed the skin of our reason for not obeying His voice and revealed the lie that's stuck inside. I say all the time, an excuse is the skin of a reason stretched over a lie. That's all that it is. We stand on our own now, and we cannot blame another person for our life and how we live. God has given us everything we need to be saved. He has provided a way out of our death penalty. If we will only confess that we are wrong, and he's right. He's right. And face up to our own guilt. We will all live on or die. Based upon what we do with the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to live or die. Both the hummingbird and the vulture fly over our nation's deserts. All vultures see his rotting meat because that's what they're looking for. Do you know that what you see in life is what you look for? It doesn't take me long to go to a store and buy something. Because I know what I want before I go to the store. And it doesn't take me an hour or two or three 
to find what I'm looking for. I, I, I find what I'm looking for because I know what I want and I go to get that. Listen. The cultures thrive on the diet of rotting meat. But hummingbirds ignore the smelly flesh of dead animals. Instead, they look for the colorful blossoms of desert plants. The vultures live on what was. They live on the past. They fill themselves with what is dead and gone. I've said before, I've said this many times, the only way the devil can defeat you is in your past. Or in your future. Get you ahead of God. The only way you can defeat the devil is now. In the present. How do you Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. God gives you all the Holy Ghost you need to take care of your todays. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. But the vultures live on what was. They live on all the, the stuff that in the past. But hummingbirds live on what is. They seek new life. They fill themselves with freshness and life. Each bird finds what it's looking for. What are you, a vulture or a hummingbird? How does your husband see you? How does your wife see you? A vulture or a hummingbird? Are you always talking about what happened months ago and years ago and on and on and on or are you are you current in your living we all find what we're looking for and that was found in Reader's Digest May of 1990 what about each one of you has life dealt you a handful of sour grapes do you feel that life has been unfair? Don't think that you're alone. All of us have felt that at some time in our life. And life is unfair. Many times life is unfair. But this is what you've got to remember. God is just. God is just. Hallelujah. Life is unfair. It would be great if we could only release ourselves from the guilt of sin by placing the blame on somebody else, but we can't. Each of us must face up the fact that it's my fault. Little Eliana, three years old. I'm sorry, it's all my fault. She, she gets in a, a little wrongdoing and, and she'll immediately say, it's all my fault. Of course, Papa takes it on his knee and says, Honey, it's not all your fault, but this is what your fault is. But it's not all your fault. It's not all anybody's fault. But all of us are part of and have a certain amount of blame. No one made me do wrong. I choose or chose to do wrong. The devil didn't make me do it. I have power over all the power of the wicked one. And so does everyone in this room. You may have brought the temptation to me, but it's my own desire and my own decision to yield to that temptation. Only when we face up to our own sour grapes and confess that we're the ones that fall and no one else can we find true repentance. There is a repentance that's not true. It's not true repentance. It's jailhouse repentance. It's repentance that, not that I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm sorry I got caught. I, I have a hand in the cookie jar and shouldn't have had it there, but I did. Mama come in and there I was. Four cookies in my hand. And my hand was so big that I couldn't get it out of the cookie jar because of all the cookies. Only when we face that, only when we quit blaming somebody else. I mean, if Mama had to set those warm cookies on the sill of the window to cool down a little bit, I wouldn't have been tempted. 
I wouldn't be having trouble if she hadn't put that beautiful crust cherry pie aroma, you know, the breeze blowing with the aroma into my nostrils. Of course, if God hadn't made my nostrils, I, I would have smelled it. You know, it would No, that's, that has nothing to do with it. It's my choice that I have to make that choice. And, and we all do, you know. Nobody makes me go get a banana split. Nobody makes me do that. But boy, when it's hot, and the sun's beating down, and you got a friend that wants to go get a banana split, it's their fault that you go and get that extra win. Or, you know, peanut butter fudge, definitive <laughs> fudge, Christmas time. Those powdered sugar little round cookies that come by a bag full because they're just small round and because my wife can make them now. She knows how to make them. You know. But if, if, if they didn't have all that good stuff, I wouldn't be tempted. That is not the problem. The hard tack candy. I love hard tack candy. I don't buy just one can of hard tack candy. I, confession's good for the soul. You know, I don't buy just one can. You know, Dollar Tree has them on sale for I think a dollar a can, maybe two dollars a can, as soon as Christmas is almost over. And my stock goes up. <laughs> I don't eat it all at once. I, I, I'm very moderate in my in my uh, indulgence of it, but. It does, you know, last for a year, <laughs> Christmas time again. I, I use me, but you know what? Every one of you have your likes and your preferences and so forth and so on. And, and, and we all are guilty, um, you know, wrong good. And, and I, I'm not saying that eating candy is a sin or cherry pie is a sin or any kind of pie is a sin. Sister Green all makes awesome apple pie, so it's violet. I mean, you know, in fact, I got to eat Violet's apple pie because Sister Green all brought her one. She wasn't here. You never know what you miss when you miss church. <laughs> it was honestly, honestly, before God, it was the best apple pie I have ever tasted. My wife don't even like apple pie, but she liked the apple pie. The crust was just un unbelievably perfect crust. It was awesome. But I can't blame her for that. I can't blame her for doing such a good job of making such a great apple pie that, you know, I just, I think it lasted for a Last the night, I guess. <laughs> I think it was gone. You know, I mean, it just, I, I don't know where it went. It just went so fast. <laughs> and a glass of cold milk, a hot apple pie. Oh my God. I've got to stop. Yeah. <laughs> I have got to stop. Uh, I got cherry pie. Uh, 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 got pie on brain. So, no more sour grapes. No more sour grapes. No more saying it's somebody else. It's fault that I did this or did that or said this or said that or whatever. I can't blame anyone else for me. Amen. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Uh, Shelly, you got those calendars with you, honey? Uh, Jenna's got some ca nice calendars. Uh, and, uh, I'm trying to help her, her sell them. She's you know, uh, doing a great job on that. And, uh, they got nice, nice uh, little cartoons in them that she's drawn, and they're they're uh, they're only twelve bucks. You got one there? Hold it up. You, you don't have them. I told you I was gonna push it tonight. Yes. She's a faithful type here, and, 
Okay, and so right. we need to help people who are faithful to God's, God's work and God's will. Amen. So if you want a calendar, let her know so that she will bring it. She, she didn't bring it. And that's okay. If you got one there, that should be okay. All right. And uh, so remember that. Remember that communion will be on the last Saturday of uh, this, this uh, month of December. Communion service, of course, Christmas is 25th. And then the community service will be on New Year's Eve. That will be on a Saturday night. We will have a 6 o'clock service. And uh, years ago, we used to have a 10 o'clock service till midnight. We would pray the old year out, the new year in, and then we would have a meal. Most of us are getting older. <laughs> Not old, but older. And 10 o'clock... So midnight, then starting again. That was not too bad with the 20. But, you know, as you get older, that, uh, that catches up with you. So what I would like to do is I would like to force to have our 6 o'clock communion service. And then uh, on Sunday, we're going to have Sunday schools on the first day of the year. Have Sunday school. Then we'll have a meal together, our first meal together as a family of God, uh, a, what do you call it, Amy? Potluck. Potluck. And, and uh, everybody brings 